Members of Council, um, certainly good to be with you this evening. I'm going to run you through the agenda, uh, which you all know, but it, it, it is packed. And, uh, and we've got several items that we need to talk about in closed session. So I'm going to uh, play uh, a little stricter on the timekeeper role tonight. You know, I'm telling to be quiet, but I'm going to at least uh, push you some. So um, we're going to talk, as you all know, you've got on your agenda tonight the uh, franchise agreement with uh, Cox Cable and uh, Martha McGann from Burns Office and Brian Grogan with uh, Esquire, I mean, with uh, Moss and Barrett. I'm going to give you a 15-minute uh, presentation on that. Most of you have uh, seen these in the past, so you've got a pretty good sense of what's coming there. Uh, Mike Goldsmith, Deputy City Manager for Public Safety, is going to give you a, re a really thought-provoking presentation in the beginning of some conversations that we're having around uh, <coughs> regional public safety and uh, particularly as it, as it uh, applies to um, uh, both natural and man-made crises that, that don't tend to stop at the, at the political borders. I think that'll be a fun conversation for you. Uh, Greg Patrick, uh, Budget Director, will step up and um, really start the, the, the public process of the 2020 uh, budget development. And uh, we'll talk about that some, tell you how, how 18 is, is closing out. Uh, but tell you what uh, the process we're going to carry through to 20. And um, obviously, you've got an item, a short term rentals item on your agenda tonight. Uh, we've had a few conversations about that, some uh, town hall meetings, and um, Deputy City Attorney Adam Alita is going to step forward and, and just give it over to you, really, I think, for, for the public uh, as much as it is for you all. And then, um, obviously, the mayor, uh, along with Mayor Alexander, along with Mayor Jones, announced uh, the presentation to the two city councils for Norfolk and Virginia Beach of a water deal. Uh, which we think is obviously really exciting and historic, and uh, you all will uh, vote on that tonight, and uh, City uh, Jim Beach will vote on that in a few weeks, and uh, just wanted Kristen Lentz to have a chance to come up and explain that one more, even though it's been written about in the paper, I think it's good for her to uh, tell the public uh, what we're doing, and then we'll jump into closed session with, uh, with several items. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martha McGann and let her introduce the um, uh, Cox Franchise Agreement. Okay, I'd like to Ryan is with the Minneapolis firm of Moss and Barnett and has a national communications law practice. He has represented more than 250 local governments in 26 states over the past two decades. He served as communications law counsel to the cities of Seattle and Chicago. Brian assisted us with our last two Cox Cable franchise renewals and we're very fortunate to have him assist with our renewal with Cox now. Well, thank you for this wonderful fall day, 50 degrees from Minneapolis. We call this summer here. <laughs> this is the third time I've been in front of this council um, to introduce a franchise for Cox Communications. I've actually worked with this city way back in the 1990s, so it's been some time. Um, you'll have to pardon me today. I have a little bit of a throat issue, so <laughs> um, we'll see how that goes. First slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to use my clicker today. First slide. The existing franchise was adopted back in 2005. It was for 12 years. It's expired in 2017. We extended it to 2018, so we are actually in a carryover mode right now but that franchise is up for renewal. It had a franchise fee in it. The franchise fee is based on gross revenues of cable services, not broadband services. So when I say broadband, I'm thinking internet, high-speed internet action for your um, citizens. This has nothing to do with broadband. This has nothing to do with telecommunications. This is just cable TV for this franchise today. The 5% fr um, franchise fee, however, was overturned by a state telecommunications communication sales tax. So right now, it's an important point that I'm going to bring up at the end of this presentation. This city does not impose a franchise fee on Cox Communications. The state imposes that fee. This fee um, so is no longer relevant in your existing franchise. And again, there's an issue I'm going to talk to you about at the end of this presentation from the FCC that's important on that topic. Another element, key element of that 2005 franchise was educational and governmental channels. Um, we had three channels in that original deal, three channels that are still there today. It was financed by a $1.5 million capital grant that was paid up front to the city. So Cox made two payments, one of a $1 million, one of 500000 They did recover that from subscribers, 
through line item pass through on the subscriber bill. So if you're all familiar with your typical bill, cable, telephone, telecommunications, sales tax, you might have your communications tax, FCC fee, you would have a uh, EG fee on there as well. That's no longer on the bill today because they have recouped that 1.5 million. Turning to the, um, what this, yes. For those channels, are you suggesting that that the 1.5 million capital grant was used to create the channels? I don't understand the, the relationship. Or that was just used for our general our general budget? Sure. So the the at the time we negotiated that, and actually uh, Martha McGann and I were on the city team at the time. What we wanted is funding to be able to support the educational and governmental channel. So what we did at that time is assess what kind of cameras, uh, equipment for this chamber, equipment to handle the government and education programming would we need and would we require. It was determined at that time by the council at that time that that level of funding would meet the needs of the city for the next 12 years. So they paid it in one lump sum and then it was used over the balance of those 12 years to fund whatever capital expenditures the city chose. Exactly how that was expended, couldn't tell you. That's obviously tied into the city budgets from years past, um, but that was what the funding was earmarked for in the franchise. Is, certainly. Moving forward, um, what we can't regulate. It's important to understand our limitations as a local franchising authority. We can't regulate telecommunications. That's regulated at the state level. Public Utilities Commission deals with that, and largely that is frankly deregulated at the state level now with the competition that's in the marketplace. We cannot regulate broadband services as part of this cable franchise. That's regulated at the federal level and really a very light touch in regulation on broadband. Right now, for the past 15 years, the feds have decided to let broadband blossom and have a very light touch on the regulation. We cannot regulate cable rates. So if we have constituents that believe that rates are too high um, or if we desire to have rates lower for a certain uh, segment of their, our constituents, Unfortunately, the feds have overruled that authority. In 2005, we did have the ability to regulate basic cable rates. That's now been overturned, so there is no longer rate regulation. That's not unique to Norfolk. That is nationwide. All cities are no longer permitted to regulate rates. Um, programming content. There's a First Amendment issue, obviously, when we have a government or a state actor involved in these decisions, so the city is prohibited from mandating programming decisions. Whether the company carries VH1 or MTV, that's up to the company. That's not something the city can influence. We can, however, control our local content for our educational and governmental channels. What can we regulate? We can regulate customer service standards. And this city team that we have put together has been very aggressive in trying to address customer service standards in our local franchise. I won't go through these bullet points because of time today, but each one of these issues has a fairly robust set of requirements in the contract to ensure that Cox will provide um, uh, high-end customer service to all of the city's constituents. Uh, reporting and enforcement, these are tools that your city staff will be able to use to make sure that Cox complies with this rather lengthy franchise or contract, as you will. Um, and we tried to make sure that those were tools that would be effective and could be utilized efficiently by your staff. Right-of-way use, we've tied the right-of-way to your city code so that if this council next year were to decide to amend the city code to change the way in which your streets are utilized, permitting requirements, restoration requirements, Cox is obligated to meet the city code requirements, same as every other right-of-way user. The reason we did it that way is to retain flexibility for this council to modify those rules going forward instead of being stuck with this for the period of um, the next 10 years. Local EG channels, um, we certainly have the ability to require these channels and to require a number of um, uh, issues related to those, and I'm going to talk about those next. Our negotiation process consisted of the renewal team. Martha McGann really quarterbacked this for the city through the city attorney's office. Um, she played the lead for the city. You see the names of all of the key individuals on the city's team. Um, I participated as well in all of the negotiations and drafting. The Cox team was led by Barrett Stork, who's here today. He is the Cox Director of Government and Regulatory Affairs. 
and he had a number of other representatives on his team that were also key in this. Um, we also retained an outside consultant, CBG Communications, to do a broadband study. That was to assess some of the broadband needs in the city, and that was related to our attempt to negotiate and amend a communication services agreement that is an exhibit to this Cox contract. You may have seen that at the end of the contract that's um, in the agenda today. The renewal negotiations um, were based on the 2005 franchise. So a key issue here is there's always a battle at the beginning of any renewal. What is the contract that you're going to discuss? The industry generally likes to use their model template. We preferred to use ours because the 2005 franchise has served this city well and has really led to very few problems between Cox and the city over the years. That was the base document we worked from, I think helped to make the negotiations rather smooth and efficient. All right, a couple more slides. The key terms of this franchise, it's a 10-year term, not a 12-year term as uh, the past deal was. The communications industry is changing, obviously. Almost everybody now has over-the-top choices. Cox is, um, frankly, not gaining customers. They're probably staying flat. They read stories about them even potentially losing customers. 10 years is as long as the city and Cox were comfortable extending this. Franchise fee. We have the right to impose a franchise fee, but as I described, that's overruled by the state through the communications sales and use tax. Um, if that were to be repealed, we have a provision in this franchise that would allow the city to implement the 5% um, franchise fee, frankly, unilaterally, if the state were to step aside and no longer impose that fee. We don't expect that to happen, but it's in there as a safety net. So the city is always going to receive fair compensation for the use of the right-of-way. We have a $100,000 performance bond and a $20,000 security fund. These are tools that the city can use to enforce compliance with this franchise. Security fund in particular, very liquid, easy for the council to, or I should say council to direct staff to go and obtain liquidated damages out of the security fund if Cox, in the unlikely event, Cox should not perform under this franchise. We have a EG fee. It is paid quarterly. The fee is set at 70 cents per subscriber per month. We think it will yield, uh, now we say approximately 420. That number could range between 350 and 420 depending upon the subscriber count and how it is implemented. But what we um, are very confident with is that this fee will yield sufficient revenue to cover the city's needs and interests for our local educational and governmental programming. This is in lieu of what was front-loaded grant money in the prior 2005 franchise. There's another provision here that says that that, 50, uh, that 70 cent fee, a portion of it will be used for an entity of the council's choosing to handle certain aspects of the government programming. Um, right now we are thinking of um, WHRO as the entity of choice. That however is up to the council. We've left that um, open-ended so that if Five years from now, that relationship isn't working, or at any point that relationship isn't working, council's decision which entity to utilize. Lastly, you can have the ability to increase this fee by up to 30 cents, keep pace with inflation, or to keep pace with um, the financial needs of the city. The next issue, the number of channels. We've continued to maintain our existing three educational and governmental channels, same as the 2005 contract. But a key change here is the ability for the city to migrate that programming to high definition. So we're all familiar with what a standard definition looks like. Anybody who watches, for example, sports programming knows that you immediately tune to the high def so you can actually see the baseball or the football. We wanted our programming, both the governmental and the educational, to be treated the same as the commercial broadcasters that are out on the, on the um, <laughs> dial because that's what people expect. If our programming is in a different format, people won't value it the same way. So we have a system in place by which Cox will improve its um, digital distribution system, allow us to then migrate to HD carriage. Um, there will be origination points from City Hall, from Norfolk Public Schools, and from WHRO to accomplish that. We unfortunately weren't able to accomplish subscriber navigation from what we call an electronic programming guide or EPG. That's the ability for you to go to a guide, see a particular thing, Saturday Night Live, hit it, record it, watch it. Many people use that guide now as their method to watch TV. 
Why do I bring it up in a meeting like this? Because we want our channels to be just like the commercial channels. If they, people can't use it the same way, they won't watch us. Unfortunately, the way Cox's system was developed, it was developed region-wide, so it doesn't have the same functionality as it would for a commercial channel. What we did is build in language to say that if Cox were to provide that functionality to any other jurisdiction in the Hampton Roads area, they will match that obligation for us. So we understand they can't do it today. Technology may evolve and change, and we've got a fail safe in the document to cover that issue. Yes? Towards the city council meetings, what you're saying is that because it's a city channel, someone can't choose to go and record it at the time that it's coming on and then watch it later, like they could do, say, The Good Doctor or some other show sure. on Cox. Sure. So, for example, The Good Doctor, I could sit down right now, go to that guide, and I could record The Good Doctor for the next six right. weeks. Right. Every new episode. Right. What I would have to do to record the meeting tonight at 7 o'clock is I'd have to know that it's on the channel at 7 o'clock, and I'd have to go to that channel, dial into the 7 o'clock, and then hit record, okay. as opposed to being able to scroll through the guide and say, boy, I really okay. like to see it. So okay. it's, it's a step down, um, okay. and we, we fought as hard as we could, but it's we can't fight. Exactly. It's a technical limitation. So there really wasn't a solution now. But as we know, technology <coughs> seems to have a way of solving these things over time. Okay. Um, service to schools and public buildings. The um, contract really mirrors a lot of what we had in the prior contract. What we did is we included an exhibit. Cox has agreed to pr continue providing all of those same services, including all of the equipment that's in the field, which is a big issue because there is a substantial amount of converter boxes and other equipment in the field. They'll continue to provide that complimentary <laughs> to the city, no charge. And we have a, a system set up which new locations would also be able to be added into that list. I mentioned earlier we have a communication services agreement. I won't go into detail on that. Again, Martha and the city attorney's office led the charge on that. It's an amended agreement that helps address some of the city's broadband needs for its own fiber network. That was actually adopted by this council, I believe, back in July, June. So it is burned into this contract, again, as an exhibit. We also, as I mentioned earlier, have strong customer service standards in here. There's probably five pages worth of language to address all manner of issues, calling the operator, visiting the operator, installations, um, you name it, it is covered in here. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that if there are issues, the city will be able to help residents and um, constituents that have concerns about how their cable service is being delivered. Before I move to the recommendation, I, I teased out at the beginning that there was an FCC issue. I just wanted to brief you on briefly. Brief you on briefly. <laughs> the, uh, the FCC about two weeks ago, unknown to us, adopted uh, a second notice um, of rulemaking, which is a complicated way of saying they are now thinking of creating an order, perhaps in the next couple of months, that would allow cable operators around the country to offset from the franchise fee that's paid to a city the costs of most franchise obligations. Everything from free service to schools and public buildings, uh, EG channels, EG connectivity, almost anything in the contract to be able to offset it. Very significant issue and many, many cities around the country are writing in comments to the FCC to say, think about this because this could adversely affect a 2019 budget, for example, if it was a unilateral change. There's a number of concerns about that. City staff has uh, analyzed this as carefully as we can. Our view is that there is no reason to not move forward with this franchise tonight, particularly in the state of Virginia, where you have a state-imposed communication sales tax as opposed to a city-imposed <coughs> franchise fee. The separation of the contract from that fee probably puts you in a unique position around the country in this state. Moreover, once that order is adopted, we do anticipate appeals will occur nationally. That will probably last for a year and a half or two years before any actual implementation. Simply would be too much uncertainty to crack this back <laughs> open and renegotiate with the unknowns that that order puts out there. But staff was very concerned that we make the elected officials aware of this issue just in a matter of full disclosure. 
we're confident that this, this is a good deal, and this is um, one that we recommend adoption by the City Council, um, and I'll certainly stand for any questions. Questions uh, with the schools. Did anybody go around and make sure that every school currently is connected to Cox and receiving television and services? Is, was that done as part of this? So we, yes, sir, we, we coordinated with the IT staff, CIO, with the schools, the over 150 facilities. He's making some hardware adjustments that will improve the situation. Okay. And then the second one is it goes back with Verizon and Fios and the franchise. Thing. So when a customer wants to switch from Cox to Verizon, they um, call Verizon. Verizon says the city of Norfolk um, will not allow us to come into the city um, because uh, um, they have this agreement with Cox. And I know that's not related to this. This is more Caesar, but it was interesting about the franchise fee because um, we were told that Verizon uh, wants Norfolk to eliminate the franchise fee uh, for them and then they would come into the city but what you're telling me tonight is that there is no franchise fee that this is a state mandate thing and that's not something that the city of Norfolk could tell Verizon we don't want you to pay this is that every uh, telecommunications company is charging this so I'm I are being charged this by the state so. it, is a, it is a statewide communication sales and use tax it applies across the board um, payment doesn't come from Cox to the city. Payment goes from Cox to the state. State then issues a payment back. And in fact, the um, city attorney's office has pursued an issue questioning some past payments on that, and the state was rather crystal clear about the disconnection between the cable franchise and the imposition of that state tax. So I... Um, I stand by the comments I made earlier. Uh, I, I understand you're getting mixed messages here, but I, I believe what I've represented tonight is the accurate picture. Yeah. And I, just, I think it's important because all of us get at least twice, three times a month, an uh, email from a constituent uh, with that accusation. And this is just going to make it even more confusing for people who watch this because if they go back to the other side, we do not regulate Cox in their rates, rate increases. But um, we hear the frustration um, uh, of that and the demand for competition uh, when that, but they, I th think it's important for people to understand there's a separation of that. Um, and I don't know, we'll still get it regardless of that. But I think that was just important to mention. I'm sure everybody else has probably heard that um, same argument. And Verizon continues to tell customers that it's our fault um, because of this contract. I mean, quite honestly, I think the issue that we all often than not is, is internet and not cable TV, which is really the only thing that this is addressing. Right. That's correct. So be, you said clearly it doesn't, it doesn't address phone, it doesn't address broadband internet, it only addresses cable TV, um, but folks just see it under one company and they have concerns about it and, you know, people want competition and we're not restricting competition. So with, so. there's, can, you right. just, can you just say that? Absolutely. <laughs> Can you clearly state that this contract in no way restricts competition in any of the above areas of broadband, internet, phone, or cable TV? 100%. This contract does in no way prevent a competitor from coming in. It's a non-exclusive franchise, and by federal law, it has to be a non-exclusive franchise. We're not permitted to create a, an exclusive relationship. One more point, I mean, I negotiated, for example, the Virginia Beach contract 12 years ago, roughly the same time we did this one. Verizon did go in there, they didn't come in here. The Virginia Beach contract has a 5% franchise fee in it. It too was preempted by the state law. There's very little difference in those contracts, having worked on both of them. Some tweaks here and there for local programming and things that are unique to the cities, but as a fundamental base document, they're very consistent. So. I hope that helps ring true that there is nothing that the cities that I'm aware of in this contract that prevents anyone from coming in. Um, I don't know if I could say it any more clearly, but that is that is the truth. Now, let me finally say as to council member's question about broadband, um, this contract does say, however, that it's for the provision of cable television service. We expressly say they're not prohibited from doing anything else in the city, they being Cox. 
Cox can provide broadband. Cox can provide telephone. We hope they provide a myriad of communication services. And this doesn't regulate them. But what we did say is we reserve the right as a city to regulate those services to the extent the law allows us to. It just doesn't occur in this contract. Where has the city decided to put the EG fee? It says we'll be paid directly to the entity of city's choice. It looks like it's 420000 annually. So, Michael, that, that the city. What, what I, wanted to, <laughs> I think that was based on a previous number, and I think the updated number that we have more current information is expected to yield 365. Yeah, when I, when I made the comment, it, it, our, our range is between 350 and 420, and, and as um, Ms. McCann mentioned, the most recent estimate is around 365. So that's what it will yield. And then perhaps Michael would want to so respond. The plan with council approval is that about 365 <coughs> of the 365 would go to WHRO in exchange for them providing broadcast services, equipment to edit, produce, broadcast, council meetings, planning commission meetings, and other uh, content on channel 48 and the other two uh, EG channels. <clears throat> is that a proposal or we're not asking you to vote that, that is a recommendation that, that's the conversation we'll have later tonight is about the franchise agreement oh i see okay so that what michael just said is accurate it's, it's going to be our recommendation it's a recommendation <laughs> correct yeah. all right so my second question is who pays for the hd upgrade that is a, um, a requirement for cox to pay for the distribution network so there are fiber um, improvements that have to be made to allow it to go from City Hall, Norfolk Public Schools, and WHRO. Everything on our side of the line, for example, HD cameras, HD sound, everything on our side of the DMARC point is going to be used or paid for out of our EG fee. They pay for everything on the distribution side going back to their head end. So when will that be upgraded on their side, HD? Is it already? It is in the process. Uh, right now, it's triggered by the effective date of this franchise. So they have a period of, I believe, 12 months within which to complete the fiber construction, after which we then have the ability to give notice and require the high definition channels. So they're committed to, within this contract, to deliver that in 12 months? Correct. Or we hold them liable for that? Or we hold them accountable? That's correct. Yep, that is a, that's a contractual okay, obligation. We definitely need to move to HD. And that was a point that we debated among the engineers on both sides at length, and um, both sides are comfortable that that's the time necessary to complete the undertaking. Okay. And then is there a penalty for not meeting the customer service standards that we've built into the contract? There are liquidated damages, uh, daily liquidated damages that would apply. The operator has the right to notice, written notice, and an opportunity to cure. So if we tell them you have failed to answer your phone, as absurd as that may sound, um, it's repeated and we have customer complaints, we'd give them written notice, they have 30 days to cure. If they fail to cure, we would then have the right to impose liquidated damages until such time as they fix it. If they refuse to fix it, again, very far-fetched in this scenario, but we would then have elevated um, enforcement <coughs> ability all the way up to franchise termination if they refuse to comply with the material term of the franchise. Rarely, just to let everyone know that, has not happened. I've been practicing in this area for 28 years, and I am not aware nationwide of a franchise that's been terminated. It almost always is sufficient motivation to allow the parties to conclude the, uh, the dispute. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Johnson. I just have a, a question, Mr. Grogan. Um, with the partnership with Norfolk Public Schools, and maybe you can or can't answer this question, um, do we still have the partnership that we're providing um, basic internet services to our, some of our families. When we say we, I mean, is the city providing basic internet? Or, or my question is, $10 a, a yeah, month yeah, or Yeah, it was something. initially $9.99. It's to our it's Norfolk there. Public School it's students. Yes. Barrett can probably Fair start, uh, Director of Government Affairs for Cox Communications. Yes, yes ma'am, that, that's not tied to the franchise agreement. Okay. That's a program that we instituted about uh, four or five years ago. Yes. 
Um, and uh, it's just something we continue to, to elevate and push forward. There's no tie to the, to the franchise agreement at all. We would love for anybody else who's interested in that program, please let us know, because we were trying to get the word out. We've helped a lot of families get connected to the Internet through that program. And, and also, Barrett, um, since we're providing that service to our Norfolk Public School scholars and their families, um, who keeps track of the data? Sure. Is it on your side or Norfolk Public Schools? I believe it would be anything on our side because it's based on the customer relationship that we have. Okay. But a lot of that data is proprietary because of restrictions on the Absolutely. ability to provide any data out to the public. Okay. Yeah, hopefully that answers but, but the question. But you do um, track or keep data on um, how many families enroll in the program, how many have been consistently um, a part of what you're providing for, yes. for them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Brian, Barrett, uh, Martha, Stephen, Michael, uh, Bernard, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciate the presentation, but also appreciate a lot of hard work that's gone into bringing that to your agenda this evening. I'm going to ask uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Mike Goldsmith to jump up, and he's going to talk to you. You know, we, we talk a lot about regional cooperation, and I think you, obviously a big night tonight with the, the, the relationship with Virginia Beach over water. Uh, we're also going to talk to you about some really interesting conversations that we're having among uh, Chesapeake, uh, Hampton, Virginia Beach, and obviously Norfolk around regional public safety and some pers uh, very specific uh, proposals that we're going to ask you to uh, help us move forward on tonight with the city of Chesapeake. And I would say to you that um, Deputy City Manager Bob Geis in Chesapeake is making a very similar proposal to his council uh, tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Goldsmith. Well, good evening, Mayor, members of council, Mr. Smith. I appreciate being given the time to talk about this topic. Uh, we are learning to start with the why for these presentations, and the why for this one is simply this. Uh, public safety professionals in cities across the country have a duty to respond as quickly as possible in an emergency, and Norfolk is no different. As we owe it to our residents to provide the best response as possible, we will be judged on the ability to deliver safety and security during a critical event as much as we are judged on anything else that we do. To tell this story, we need to go back to the events of 9-11, a date when our world changed. As we all know, Islamic, Islamist extremists hijacked four planes, flew two into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, one into the Pentagon, and then the last one crashed into a field in Pennsylvania. It was a highly coordinated attack that demanded a highly coordinated response. Uh, while the response was absolutely heroic, the 9-11 Commission report pointed out issues with coordination amongst the multiple agencies that were involved in the response. As a result, in response to these findings, a number of Homeland Security presidential directives were issued. One of these created the National Response Framework, which guides the country, how the country responds to all types of disasters and emergencies. It is built on scalable, flexible, and adaptable concepts. The National Incident Management System, which is a part of the NRF, is a comprehensive natural, national approach to incident management. It improves coordination for all potential incidents, regardless of size, location, or complexity. The result is better communication between local, state, and federal partners. We as a region also responded. In fact, we are known for our dedication to continuous improvement in public safety and homeland security. To that end, we applied for and achieved a Tier 2 Urban Area Security Initiative designation. This funding provided for regional training, regional exercises, and gap analyses to show where we could improve our response. Some of the highlights include the 2010 UASI Gap Analysis and Capability Assessment. In 2011, working with the state and the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Asymmetric Warfare, we hosted the Hampton Roads full-scale exercise which tested our response to a Mumbai-type incident. In 2017, the City of Chesapeake hosted the Joint Counterterrorism Awareness Workshop, a large tabletop exercise for the entire Hampton Roads region, talking about how we might address a complex coordinated terrorist attack. Also in 2017, we hired the Cordillera Applications Group to give a regional workshop on urbanization trends and the challenges they will bring to public safety. This slide is not all-encompassing. People like Jim Reddick, Chief Wise, Chief Boone have spent lots of effort working with their colleagues in other cities, making sure we can respond to any number of threats, natural and man-made. 
throughout all of this work, two recurrent themes have emerged. While we have continued to improve our response to these large incidents, we still have gaps in unified command and operational coordination, as well as regional coordination. We have gotten better since 9-11, but we still lag in these two areas. And while this history is rooted in a terrorist attack, we cannot ignore the weather threat in this area. We will continue to face larger and stronger storms, as evidenced by Florence and Michael. We have seen with these incidents the vital need for a coordinated regional response. Recognizing this, Norfolk, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, and Hampton have been accelerating coordination for the last two years. As stated before, we hired the Cordillera Applications Group, a company made up of former NATO military officers, urban planners, retired police and governance experts with close links to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, to assist our cities to explore three major lines of effort. The first being define what an emergency operations center common operating picture looks like, Second, coordinate better communications between our EOCs, implementing a full spectrum communications check on a set schedule. Third, looking at standardized unmanned aerial vehicle, unmanned aerial system capability to allow for better local support by leveraging these systems as regional assets. They have also facilitated a large event tabletop exercise that all four cities attended, as well as the urbanization seminar mentioned earlier. So the title of this slide is the fundament, fundamental reason we are here tonight. What public sa the question we are asking is what public safety services might be linked or enhanced across multiple jurisdictions to deliver services to our communities more effectively and efficiently, and where possible, achieve economies of scale for better outcomes. With this in mind, Chesapeake, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and Hampton have actively been working to enhance interoperability in the public safety realm. These bullets are some of the ideas we think have merit. Could we develop a regional emergency operations center? Could we develop a regional or linked 911 dispatch center? Can we enhance mutual aid and automatic aid? What are the things we haven't even thought of yet as we continue to work together as a region? So what is our request tonight? We are here tonight to ask council to support a resolution that will allow the city of Chesapeake and the City of Norfolk to explore the next steps of potentially linking Emergency Operations Center functions and functionality and potentially linking 911 dispatch, as well as other public safety ventures that make sense. The goal of this effort is to see where we can provide more effective and efficient public safety response for all of our cities. The idea is to create a win-win scenario for any city that decides to collaborate. While we don't have any preconceived ideas on what the future may look like, our ask is to allow us to fully explore our options. This is a story of continuous improvement that started on 9-11-2001. While our public safety agencies have worked hard and successfully to improve response, it is time for us to take the next logical step in our development. If we are to deliver safety and security to our residents, increase our ability to respond to major events, natural or man-made, we must be able to work as a region. These threats care little about lines on a map. If we are to accomplish the goal of a safe and secure Norfolk, we must look at regional solutions. Mayor Alexander, the vision you set was to seek regional solutions in public safety. We have worked with that in mind. This is our chance to move further down the road. I want to thank the city attorney and Martha McGann in particular. They are helping us work through the resolution that will be presented on your docket for November 20th. Questions? Okay, thanks, sir. Excellent. Good job. Mike, great stuff. Thank you, bud. It is, um, and I think what we're learning are, in terms of these regional activities is um, uh, different cities um, within the 17 really have certain specific interests, and whether it's around broadband or water or, um, or public safety, um, or the uh, revenue sharing uh, economic development model that some folks on the peninsula are putting together. Smaller groups of cities are starting to break off and, and, and work through those things and then br ultimately bring them to, to the region. And you'll see, you're see really seeing Norfolk try to play a leadership role around public safety and um, uh, around stormwater right now. And so I think that's a model that's going to serve the region well and, and uh, 
Um, uh, the text we got earlier is the conversation in, in Chesapeake went well as well, and uh, so we'll bring that resolution back to you on the uh, 20th of November. All right. So with that said, I'm going to ask Greg Patrick to step forward and um, give you a uh, look at um, uh, sort of how 18 is, is winding up um, and uh, then the process for starting 19. And um, I feel good about the, the conversations that we had last year, right? We did a pretty deep dive uh, relative to the budget. We did a deep dive with you all, and, and Ms. Graves was kind enough to speak on behalf of the full council and say, I'm tired of talking about this budget. We, <laughs> so we met our goal. We also got the community, I think, much uh, more deeply involved. And so we're going to build on that public involvement this year. Uh, we're going to have some particular conversations, and Greg will highlight these for you in a minute, but in the, in the coming months around uh, debt and our, and our capital <coughs> capacity. Uh, we're going to have some frank conversations around service levels and the service levels that, that we provide. And, and uh, I think it was Ms. McClellan that coined the, the idea of, of uh, fewer better, you know, and I think that's a conversation we're going to really want to have with you all and really force some of those uh, challenging conversations and then uh, take a hard look at uh, your financial policies. So that will be kind of the, the, the processes that we go through and the things that we focus on uh, this fall and spring. Greg? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Uh, today, we're going to take a look back at uh, fiscal year 2018 and how we uh, anticipate uh, to finish uh, on the general fund side our, our, our year end. And then we'll take a look at um, fiscal year 2020 budget development, uh, what we look like preliminarily. Um, uh, there's no council action required at this time. Uh, so our preliminary year-end numbers for the general fund uh, revenue is uh, came in. At, it, we're projecting will come in at 1.3 percent over budget. This is almost all driven by um, the one-time revenue from uh, SWIFT of 15 million dollars. Um, on the expenditure side, we're projected to come in about 1.2 percent below budget. Um, and, and when um, when you account for designations, the largest of which is uh, designating that $15 million of SWIFT towards school construction. Uh, our preliminary surplus looks like uh, to be about 0.1 percent, and what that means in real dollars is about half a million dollars. Um, as far as recommendation for uh, the surplus funds this year, uh, we are going to recommend that we use that to increase our, um, our reserves. Um, in, the, in the coming weeks, uh, we want to present to you um, some recommendations for adjusting uh, the financial policies that council, adjust, uh, council adopted in, in 2013. Uh, one of the recommendations that we will make is that we increase uh, some of our reserves. Um, so rather than make a recommendation specifically as to what reserve uh, to add this uh, surplus money to, we'd like to have that conversation and, and, and give council an opportunity to, to weigh in there. So let's look ahead to uh, fiscal 2020 budget development. Now, this is a familiar slide. This is how we put the budget together each year. First, we start with last year's adopted budget, and we'll remove any one-time expenditures that we, that we made in fiscal year 2019. We'll annualize any prior year costs. So, for instance, we're, we're uh, providing a salary increase beginning in January of 2019. That's only half a year. We've got to annualize the full year cost in fiscal year 2020. Uh, and then we'll adjust uh, those, uh, those costs that we, that we must continue to pay. So benefits, uh, employee benefits, debt service, um, contractual costs uh, that, that creep up each year. Uh, finally, that, that will get us to our uh, preliminary fiscal year 2020 base budget. So before we look at, uh, at where we are for fiscal year 2020, let's take a look at what's in the base and what's not in the base. And that's changed a little bit this year. Uh, because of the, the school funding formula that Council implemented as part of the fiscal year uh, 2019 budget. Uh, so first, what's not in the base? New initiatives. New initiatives are not in the base. A salary increase for employees in fiscal year 2020 is not in the base. Uh, any program expansion is not in the base. So basically what the base is, is maintaining the status quo. So it's, it's the cost to do business the way we're doing business today with one caveat. And that caveat is as a result of the school funding formula, we are carrying new additional funding for Norfolk Public Schools in the, in the base this year, um, as it's required as part of the school funding formula. Um, in the base also, we've got our largest budget drivers, which I'm sure you're um, aware of, our uh, debt service, employee benefits, um, annualizing our salary increase. Um, but if you look at the chart here, we're going to open up fiscal year 2020. Uh, with a budget gap of $8.2 million. Um, 
But of that 8.2, uh, 2.4 of that is increased funds for Norfolk Public Schools. So we're going in that, that what the um, school funding formula tells us is that uh, based on the adopted policy, Norfolk Public Schools will get an additional $2.4 million of funding. So if you were to compare this gap to what the gap looked like in previous years, what we would be reporting to you is $5.8 million as opposed to 8.2 because we never would have included new uh, additional funding to Norfolk Public Schools at this point in the process. So let's take a look at uh, where we've been in the past in terms of, uh, of, of budget gaps. If you look back, you know, following the, uh, uh, the, the Great Recession, we had some really tough years in fiscal year 12, 13, and 14. Um, the budget gap that we have this year, 8.2 million or 5.8 million, if you look at it comparatively to the past, is, is very much on the, on the lower end of, of where we've been. Um, the obvious question, of course, is we increased our real estate tax by 10 cents last year. Why do we have a budget gap? Um, just keep in mind that the, 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 the tax increase went to fund new programs and services. So looking forward uh, out over the course of the next 10 years in our budget outlook, um, it's, a very, it's a very familiar story. At this point, you know, we are uh, projecting that uh, um, our real estate tax um, uh, a real estate uh, assessment growth uh, is going to be similar to what it's been the last couple of years, between 2 and 2.4% and each year. Um, which, and what that means is, you know, to maintain the status quo, um, right now our expenditure base is, is, is outpacing our revenue growth. Um, and this is the same story as it, as it was last year and the, and, and the year before. Uh, what we need at this point is, is either... Um, uh, is for our assessment growth to return to what it had been historically, uh, between 4 and 5%. I have a question. <coughs> uh, Senator Chen, you said part of this is um, including the salary increases. Since the $0.10 cents tax increase, why... And that's an ongoing 10 cents. It's not going away July 1st of next year. Right. Why did, is that the reason why you're including the salary increase in the base budget? We're including the salary increase that will take place in January of 2019. So in fiscal 19, in this fiscal year, mm -hmm. in the base, because in fiscal year 19, we're only paying for half a year. So in fiscal year 2020, we have to pay for the other half. So it's that annualization that's in the base rather than a new salary increase in fiscal year 2020. So potential strategies to, to uh, address the base budget gap, you know, first and foremost, it's find efficiencies within our existing level of service delivery, which really means, you know, find ways to be more efficient, more effective at doing what we do right now and providing the level of service that we that we provide, provide now. Uh, from there, it's conversations around aligning our spending with our, our, our current revenue reality. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, building a, a citywide program catalog that, that, that gives us a, a really good sense of, of um, what we actually spend our money on. Um, and we're going to use that program catalog to help us consider um, service levels around the city. Um, and then there are items at the state level that we'll advocate for. Um, you know, first, it's the, it's the restoration of state aid reductions, especially in our priority areas of education and public safety. You know, it's important to, to note that in the course of the last 10 or 11 years, in terms of buying power, we've lost $74 million um, in, in state aid. Um, and then we'll work with the coalition of, of jurisdictions um, to, to, uh, to, to help us work on items such as uh, modernizing the uh, communication sales and use tax and, and funding for, for transit. So the takeaways, uh, it's really important, and, and Council's done a great job of maintaining our fiscal dis discipline and, and financial stability. Um, it's important that we have, you know, what might be you know, some difficult conversations around what are sustainable service levels, um, and then to take a long-term view. For as long as we can continue a maintenance CIP that helps us um, maintain our fiscal stability and our, and our um, fiscal discipline, and, and then really continue to focus on inclusive economic growth and strategic economic development. 
And then finally, a, a, um, a look at the overview of our uh, fiscal year 2020 budget development calendar. Um, very generally speaking, we'll present council with a more formal calendar in January. Uh, the one thing that we have um, uh, adjusted here um, is, is we've moved our proposed budget presentation date into March from April. Uh, this is a real benefit to, to Norfolk Public Schools. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, a time crunch on us, but, but it, it really helps um, Norfolk Public Schools uh, with the presentation of their budget, as I believe they're legally required to uh, adopt a budget by April 1st. Um, so that's a benefit to them. Um, and, and like I said, we'll get you a, a formalized version of this in, uh, in, in January. I just re remember in May that we voted on the budget way too late, too, for Norfolk Public Schools. So, they, I mean, because of their meeting schedule, I guess, too, we were just so late, and they're holding up contracts for teachers who are looking at jumping to other districts while they're holding up possible raises and things that could be going through. So, I mean, every year the school board has requested if we could get our vote in quicker. I think we were voting the last week in May last yeah. year. Yeah. I mean, it's way too late for getting contracts out to teachers, and we don't we can't afford to lose um, any teachers in Norfolk. But um, something to consider with that um, as we you know move forward and getting it maybe the second week in May at that meeting, if possible. Yeah, the idea we'll certainly look at that. And the, the good news here is with the with the uh, funding formula. I mean, they've got a pretty good sense of where we're heading, all right? So that, that is. So I that, understand that, right. but they still need us to vote yes, on the budget I know, and I hear in order for them to vote on theirs. Yeah. So they've got to receive that, you know, that funding. So, all right, so we'll think through those dates with y'all. Sure. Is it possible to vote solely on the funding formula outside the budget, so that they know what they're getting? I mean, I don't. Is it is it pot, like we take, have the consent agenda yeah. and we I take have pieces to ask out? Is it possible to that? And that would give them what they need, and they don't have to be held up by us, and we can just work out the rest, because if that's the money they're going to get, that's the money they're going to get. So... Really interesting question. And so the open... Yes, um, if we wanted to bifurcate and just approve that portion, it's something you could do. Whether you wanted to, you could decide. Because well, the open, um, I guess, um, not enrollment for teachers, <clears throat> but the decision whether they're going to stay with Norfolk, or not is what March and April where they go on interviews um, the yeah. possibility of staying with Norfolk or not um, councilwoman or when other Dor divisions come after our teachers A absolutely <laughs> yes um, when does that start March April <laughs> well it's ongoing okay. but there is that window of time between March and April because when May hits they want to be finished with budget items and I think we we have to we've tried to be really to, much more sensitive to that the, uh, Catherine came last year helped us with the health care expense remember we used to approve those things when, in the fall and now we're trying to get those numbers to them in the spring so they're able to say to teachers here's what's going to be in your package and that's what so um, I appreciate anything you can uh, do to help well, give us insight into all that and it's we'll, important we'll, to also advertise early about how the spending formula works because almost was the eighty-five percent of the speakers who speak at the budget hearing are teachers asking for more money, but this with the new formula, this should be. They're getting more money. They're getting more money. They um, have to decide how to use it. Yeah. No, uh, public schools have to decide how to use it. Yes, correct. And I think that's something that's important too in messaging, that we're giving them the money, and it's up to Norfolk Public Schools what they do with it. And if they see their teachers as a priority, then they'll give their teachers a raise. So, I just have a question. Well, two. Um, Mr. Manager. Yes, ma'am. Are we currently in discussions with Norfolk Public Schools as far as the budget? Have we started the talks with them? Um, so, so, this was the intent of the, of the funding formula, was to, to really to take that, that dynamic and that tension out of the, the, the public debate, if you will, so, so that, you know, uh, Greg, I think, had a slide of it. We, they see what their funding looks like with right. our growth assumptions for the next 10 years. Right. So, um, but, but even though, although we have the, the formula in place and we may, may not be coming to them on site or 
they coming to us on site, have we still had some type of communications with Norfolk Public Schools as far as where they're going and where we're doing? Not having to, to wait um, possibly until the springtime where we all, you get in the room with Norfolk Public Schools, they clearly understand the process of what we generated and what we started and what is going to be expected that they will get. But I think even with that, communication is very important and we need to see where they are right now because we're going into the end of October and going through the process leading up to the budget for Norfolk Public Schools and the, the city of Norfolk. So let me answer it this way, and it may, it may okay. or may not get to you. So, so I think we're having very specific conversations. Yes. I, I spent 50 minutes with the school board last week making a presentation on St. Paul's and taking their questions and telling them what's going on. So I had that. Um, Catherine's got uh, the health care consortium. So we're having uh, very constant co conversations about what that looks like. So we're, uh, we're, we're having conversations, as you all know, about a CTE school. And so there's, there's these conversations going. So I think communication is good on specific topics. But they know their base revenue. Right. The, the question is going to be the um, expected growth and what that number is. And you could always give them a number, and if the revenue comes in higher, go back and adjust that well, later. We do. We true up so, at the end. That's right. So there has to just be a date that you just say it's two point four million, um, and this is it. And then we'll come back in July and clean it up if the you know or October and clean it up if there's more money. Are you going to talk about the true up process? The yeah, policy I, actually lays out specific think, time yeah, frames yeah. for communication. We'll let them know about the two point four sometime about February. We'll let them know if we've made any adjustments based <clears> on revenue. Um, better improved revenue numbers and then there's a true up process at the end of the fiscal year to make sure if we missed it they would get part of that and it's you. important to remember that that 2.4 is made up of a lot of assumptions around a lot of different revenues. So those, those are those those can adjust throughout the year. Um, and, and 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 Norfolk Public Schools is is familiar with I mean it's the bu it's the bucket of revenues that they kind of picked last year as we were going through this. So they're very familiar with with how that process works. And we send them to the state legislators Kenny uh, yeah. for the other funding. So That's great. tell teachers that I have one more lobby state wanted. legislators. And this yeah. is what they wanted. I mean, is, isn't it what they wanted to know? Yes. To have some yes. assurances and some... Yes. some it would never be enough. Yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead. I just have one more question, Greg. Um, you mentioned the city assessments um, in some localities and some of the council members. We've asked this question over and over again about uh, property assessments. <clears throat> some of the assessments we see going up some of the assessments continue to go down in different neighborhoods, which then has an impact on our revenue. Um, do you see um, what is the cause of assessments going up in some areas and assessments going down in others, and how can we fill that gap? Uh, that, that's a question that's really outside of my expertise. So, we'll have a chance to we we'll have a chance to speak from the uh, I'm just asking the, the you with the money too. So so Douglas um yes, sir. Assess. so we've talked a lot about uh, revenue. But we have a we have a we have a uh, a problem of structural imbalance here because if expenditures are growing faster than revenue, um, that's not healthy. And the $18.5 million that we just generated with the new taxes is spent. Uh, right. It's spent. Um, and so here, here's the question. How are we planning to reverse that trend uh, that, you know, our revenue is robust, mm -hmm. it's rigorous, uh, and we can continue to make the investments that, that we need in infrastructure and stormwater, um, flood mitigation. I mean, we have a slew of issues that we, we need to discuss. And so what is the economic development plan? And you don't have to tell me now, but certainly um, we have to have an economic development plan to generate the revenue uh, that we need. We cannot continue to tax our residents uh, real estate taxes. We have to figure out how to grow the economy through other means besides uh, the real estate taxes. So hopefully there will be a presentation that you can tell us, maybe economic development or some other means, how do we grow and diversify this economy? 
Greg, thank you. Appreciate it very much. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, Deputy City Attorney Adam Alita to step forward. Y'all have uh, been involved in a lot of conversations about short-term rentals. And um, uh, Adam is going to tell you where we've landed and what's on your agenda this evening. Thank you, Mr. Manager and members of council. Um, it, it's been a while. It's been a lot of work. Um, but we do have on your agenda tonight uh, public hearing item number one, uh, a comprehensive uh, zoning text amendment um, to adopt uh, a program for short-term rentals um, throughout the city. Um, that uh, hard work has included the mayor's town hall meetings. Uh, during this process, we've adopted a new zoning ordinance. The manager uh, set up a special committee, committee to analyze just this issue. Um, we've been watching the Norfolk market in short-term rentals. We've been watching what the General Assembly's been uh, doing or asked to do with regard to a statewide approach. Um, we finally had a proposal ready earlier this year. Um, we presented a, a Q&A session to the folks in Ocean View who have been uh, intimately engaged with, um, with this topic for some time. We did that in August and then the public uh, hearing before the Planning Commission uh, in September at which they're making a unanimous recommendation to you um, to adopt this proposal. So what I want to do for you um, kind of quickly here is to run through um, the guiding principles one more time that informed our plan and then walk through one or two examples of how the various options or approaches that are laid out in, in this amendment uh, work for folks who want to do a short-term rental um, and then address any questions you may have. So uh, this slide runs through the principles that we uh, kept in mind as we developed the, the plan. The market is here. Um, it's not a fad. It's not going away. The fact that it's illegal just about everywhere in Norfolk except for the two locations where you approved a conditional use permit um, has not operated to prevent the activity. So um, it's here. Uh, they provide, short-term rental operators provide a, a product that certain types of guests uh, want. Um, the latest information we have um, is, uh, and this I think is from August of this year, 309 discrete rental units available on the online platforms. Um, most of those units are for more than, uh, are rented out for more than 30 nights total per year. Um, all short-term rentals are for a period of time less than 30 days, but when you start adding them together, um, each of these units is, is rented repeatedly throughout the year, um, and they're averaging about $115 uh, per guest per, uh, per night. So, um, we don't think that keeping it illegal solves the problem, um, and there is some evidence that these um, types of rentals can be operated in a responsible way, and the challenge is to find out um, how that can be done and how can we um, manage any of the negative externalities. Guiding principle number two, identify the locations. Um, the experience in other localities in Virginia, indeed localities throughout the country, um, with this issue um, is to um, try to find out where it's happening by requiring a registry. Um, that is the approach that, that the General Assembly um, enabled localities to, to employ. That is the best way for the city to know um, who's operating these facilities and where they're going on. Uh, the challenge is how do you entice people to register um, and let the city know that that they're engaged in this activity. So part of, part of the approach uh, for this proposal is to incentivize in, uh, the registration process um, to make it a benefit to be registered and not an additional burden for the, for the um, responsible operator. The next principle, protect neighborhoods. Um, while many short-term rentals go on without creating incident, the fact that uh, there are problems, uh, it may not be every single guest in a particular short-term rental, it may be occasional, um, but problems do occur. And so um, the challenges we wanted to address with this approach was to come up with a mechanism to minimize the problems at the front end, and then when the problems occur, because they will, um, to have a process that would be simpler and more efficient to uh, identifying a resolution um, and, and fixing the problem uh, so as to minimize problems that neighbors are going to, to run into from time to time. Uh, 
I think I've touched a little bit on, on the making compliance easy, but uh, just to uh, uh, put a finer point on it, uh, we want the voluntary registry to be easy to use. We've committed to um, enabling an online registration portal so that, um, so that the compliant operators who want to register have a, a simplified way to do it, uh, and that would be, there would be no charge for that uh, registration. Um, and then the final bullet point is really what we've spent the last several months working on is customizing uh, what would be permitted by zoning district. As you know, Norfolk is a city of neighborhoods, and uh, not everything that's good for one neighborhood is good for another. The experience in the coastal area of Norfolk is very different from downtown, is very different from maybe the traditional west side of Norfolk, is very different from the suburban um, east side of Norfolk. So. We have taken some pains to try to come up with uh, slight variations depending on the zoning districts and even the types of dwelling units within each zoning district. So I'm going to run through just a few examples for the two types of homestays that this uh, ordinance would allow. The first is the homestay. Um, this one, I think, is less common. Um, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, we don't get as many complaints about the homestay style of short-term rental. This is where the um, uh, operator of the facility is present during the entire time that the guest is there. So uh, under this sort of approach, um, I'll take an example from uh, any of the um, single-family districts, whether it's SF2 or SF4, uh, even the residential coastal district. For a single family home there, this approach gives you three options. And the way the table works is at the top, you identify what zoning district your property's in. Uh, the next row, um, you identify what type of dwelling you have, whether it's single family or two family, multifamily. Um, and then the third row identifies what your options are. And for every one of these uh, categories, there's um, uh, two and in, in certain cases, three options. So for the single family home um, in the coastal, uh, residential coastal district or the SF2 district, um, they could get approval for a homestay any one of three ways. Um, they could do it by right, um, just get a zoning certificate and a business license um, and start operating a short term rental uh, as a homestay. Now the limitation on that is we would not permit that activity uh, in an accessory dwelling unit. So if you do have an approved accessory dwelling unit, maybe a room over a detached garage, um, that would not be permitted under the buy right option. Now, uh, under option two, the registration, which again is free and online, um, that would be permitted. You could use your accessory dwelling unit or the principal unit under that approach. And then again, as I said, because the registration is voluntary, if you don't want to do the registration, you don't want to provide the information um, that's included in the registration, the uh, name of the operator, the 24 hour uh, contact person, proof of insurance, um, proof of a courtesy fire inspection, the essentials for public safety um, that would be verified through the registration process, you're always um, entitled to come to the city council and get a conditional use permit. There are opportunities to do homestays in multifamily dwellings. The requirement in this uh, batch of, of ordinances is that um, you do have to be the owner of the unit to do the homestay. So what that really means is for a multifamily building, it's going to have to be a condo because the owner of the unit is going to have to be present while the guest is there. So an apartment building would not be available to be used as a homestay. other side that they're not living in as the, where, where does that fall? That would be a vacation rental. And the reason is because they'd be living in one dwelling unit, but the guest would be staying in an entirely separate dwelling unit. It's not an accessory dwelling unit. It's its own dwelling unit. And so the guest would have the complete use of that second the unit of the duplex. And so that would be considered a vacation rental. So with that segue into vacation rentals, this is, where, this is where we've done the most work. This is the type of short-term rental that typically causes an issue 
um, when, we do see, when we do see complaints coming from neighbors. So the table that's laid out in the, uh, in the ordinance works the same way. You identify what zoning district the property is in first, then you identify the type of property, and then you look at what options. Under the vacation rental, there are generally two options, and in some circumstances, uh, only one option, a, a conditional use permit for certain, uh, for certain types of, of dwellings in certain districts. But we'll, we'll do a couple of examples. Um, let's look uh, first at, at downtown. That's an interesting one. We don't have any single-family homes downtown. So for the downtown districts, you're looking exclusively at multifamily uses. So we have two options available. Um, we can either uh, permit a vacation rental if the operator registers that property. Um, there is a limitation that no more than twin 10 dwelling units on the property would be made available uh, under this format. Um, and then uh, with a business license, that, that use can commence. Alternatively, um, again, if the operator does not want to register or wants to use more than 10 units, uh, in their multifamily dwelling, they could get a conditional use permit. Looking at, for example, the RC district, again, this is one of the areas of the city that sees this activity more. Um, we can take an example of a single family dwelling, um, two options. You can either register or get a conditional use permit. Both of those are paths to, um, uh, that, that would be available to use your single family dwelling as a vacation rental. Um, and then I'll quickly mention, uh, it's essentially the same process for a multifamily, a two-family or a multifamily uh, dwelling in the residential district. Um, there is a, a little bit of a wrinkle here. Um, we are aware of complaints um, in localities that have more short-term rentals than Norfolk does, that um, as short-term uh, rental activity increases in volume, especially in areas where there is not a lot of affordable housing, um, there, it may start to distort the market for affordable housing as the owners start to turn units over for rental to sh on a short-term basis rather than, than a traditional 30-day or year-long rental. And so what we've done here is to say that by right for a multifamily dwelling, you could have one of your units available as a short-term rental if you registered, but if you wanted to use more than one, that would require a conditional use permit. have localities that have more short-term rentals than we do seen um, any increase in um, real estate prices or real estate sales because of the popularity of a short-term rental income? Because that would be a consideration for a buyer. So if I'm looking to buy a property that maybe I'm using as a vacation home, and then I'm thinking about what is what's the additional income that I can receive from it. I may be willing to pay more because I can rent, you know, I can rent out and make more money. Is that yes, I understand your thinking. I don't know the numbers, so I can't tell you whether they, whether that's empirically um, provable. I can tell you that we did have comments during our um, public outreach meeting and in our public hearing meeting that there are operators who are right now. Um, looking at making investments into uh, multifamily properties and doing additional capital improvements if they are able to use them for this use, but they're probably not as interested in making those capital improvements if they can only be used for regular or longer term rentals. So to the extent there is additional value that can be extracted on the market for those uses, there may be additional investment just from the comments that were received during our outreach process. Well, not, well, not local. Uh, Iceland has, has experienced such a tremendous amount of B&B &B mm -hmm. that uh, citizens are having difficulty getting housing at, at all. Oh, so the, okay. So it has resulted in a, a, a very serious escalation in housing shortage, uh, okay. at least in Iceland. Okay. A lot of things to think about in Okay. Right. San Francisco and New York and, right. and some of the cities where there's thousands of these are very worried about that issue. Thomas? Adam, I get a lot of concerns from <clears throat> residents in Willoughby who are worried about the 8 to 12 flex multifamily unit buildings uh, and what that may, what may happen to those units if they all turned into uh, Airbnb. Can you walk us through or walk me through what the process would be for someone who has an 8 to 12 unit multifamily building in that zoning district? What, what would be their options? Um, 
Right. So, so right now, um, some of that goes on, and it's not legal. So I think that um, there is some interest in doing that. Um, if with this amendment, what they would be able to, do, what an operator would be able to do, is to um, start using one of those. You could register and start using one of those units just through the administrative process. But if they came forward with a, with a proposal to say, I have a, a, a 10 unit building. Um, I'd like to um, renovate it and market it exclusively for um, short-term rentals online, all 10 units, that would require a conditional use permit. So all of the things that you do to check with the uh, Civic League uh, and with surrounding neighbors to verify that uh, the use could be operated with conditions that would manage negative impacts would uh, be explored during that process. Um, and if you're going to get to What's the enforcement if someone who owns that 10 unit building doesn't get the COP but starts doing it anyways? Where are enforcement? So uh, I, I will use that as an opportunity to segue to the last slide. So, uh, so I indicated to you one of the um, features that we thought was essential to make this work, to make sure that folks who as easy as you made it and as free as you made it to make the people who, who voluntarily register um, reap the benefits of that process was to enhance our enforcement that we'd have to do more than wait for a citizen complaint because that's only catching the problem locations anybody who's operating illegally and not creating a problem um, would do would be able to do so cheaper than uh, than the person who complies so what we've identified and there are, there are uh, third-party companies that do this work um, but we've identified vendors um, who will collect that information and provide it to the city, uh, the information of everything that's listed on the online platforms by address. And so what we would propose to do, and, and if this uh, amendment is adopted, we would start the process of uh, procuring that vendor and identifying the enforcement protocol as to how frequently we review that information and send out inspectors. But essentially what we'd be doing is anybody who's not registered or doesn't have a conditional use permit that shows up on one of these tracking sites as having uh, a listing um, will receive a visit from an inspector. And so with uh, a year or two of rigorous enforcement, um, our hope is to um, chase all of the guests into the compliant properties and the non-compliant properties go out of business. We're also in, I'm also in discussions with representatives from Airbnb. I have reached out to Expedia Group as well. I haven't heard from, from them yet but spoke to the uh, Airbnb lobbyist yesterday, um, told them that we want to work with them, that we want uh, Airbnb to help potential guests identify which properties are registered, which properties are legal, um, in, by badging them on the site or, or indicating in some other way that these are the operators who've already checked all the boxes. Um, they like that idea. They're working with their engineers to identify how to do that. Um, they were on hold until they knew for sure we wanted to take this approach towards short-term rentals. Um, but that's another way to um, ask the market to help us uh, reward the compliant operators and, and, and leave the non-compliant operators out in the cold. In addition to that carrot economic incentive, we have the traditional stick, the zoning enforcement, and so that there can be injunction and, and any other zoning remedy. So that we have the carrot and the stick. Okay. And, and Adam, with these companies like Airbnb, when I want, if I want to make an Airbnb at my house, then I register with Airbnb for Norfolk. Is there a special line that can pop up that says, just to let you know, this locality has ordinances and rules that require you to file? Just like when I get an alarm, the alarm company notifies me that I should get a permit. If I don't get one, um, there'll be a fee if the police respond to a call. And I don't have a permit on file, but is there a way to regulate that? That any of these companies have to put that language on somebody who wants to register with them? Um, I, I don't know if we can regulate what they have to say on the site. I think um, they uh, right now we're at the stage of, of working with them to see what they're willing to put on there. I think Airbnb already does in some localities say there are local rules you may need to comply with. Please check. Um, but this would be a step above that. This would be some way, some sort of logo or other indication right on the main listing page so that the guest knows 
when they're comparing the $90 a night property to the $110 a night property, what exactly it is that they're getting when, when they book. So, um, so if it's adopted tonight, we need a little bit of time to finish with the online portal, um, and so we'd be looking at starting next year. No, you didn't. <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't add anything to the slide. Uh, that that is not part of the zoning changes, but that is part of the program. That all of the there there would be a business license required, uh, because uh, all of these people are engaged in commercial activity, um, and at the time of establishing the business license, a transient occupancy tax account would need to be opened. So, uh, one of the pieces of information we tell people if they register is that they're going to have to keep track of their guests. Um, fortunately, some of these third-party vendor sites that will tell us where the activity is occurring can also tell us how much activity is occurring. So there may be some intelligence that we can gather as to how much activity is going on the site so we can try to cross-reference that information against what kind of returns the commissioner revenue is seeing. Um, but taxes are going to have to be paid on this revenue. What is the transient, transient occupancy, occupancy tax? Occupancy taxes for the city of Norfolk. It's eight percent of gross revenues, okay. plus three dollars per bed night, which is exactly the same as for hotels, motels. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Adam, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, Kristen Lentz, uh, our utilities director, to step forward. And then, um, as you know, that I said earlier, Mayor Jones, and Mayor Alexander made an announcement last week and was covered in the newspaper about the water contract uh, proposal that you all will vote on this evening, but wanted. Kristen, have a chance to come up and explain it to folks on our government channel. Mr. Mayor, members of council, item R2 on your agenda this evening is an ordinance that would authorize the city manager to enter into two contracts that are water related simultaneously with the city of Virginia Beach. And this presentation is intended to provide you with the background information and specific contract terms that support staff's recommendation that you approve that ordinance. The impetus for this recommendation is a conversation between uh, Mayor Alexander and Mayor Jones based on their relationship of mutual respect. And as a result of that conversation, they came back and told their staffs to work together to develop a contract that would meet uh, both cities' water-related needs. Um, as background uh, for the whole concept, uh, Norfolk owns and operates uh, the vast majority of the, uh, all the water facilities in Southside Hampton Roads. And Virginia Beach currently doesn't buy any water from us. Uh, Norfolk treats the Virginia Beach water that they get from Lake Gaston under a water services contract that expires in 2030. And the partnership between Norfolk and Virginia Beach, whereby we treat their water, has been very successful for both cities um, for more than 20 years. Taking a look at each one of the city's uh, water-related needs, um, it's understandable Virginia Beach wants to secure their water future. And for them, that means they want uh, water treatment facilities for their water in the long term, not that just expire in 2030. They also want to have enough water supply to support all their future growth needs. Uh, Norfolk has the enviable position of having 10 million gallons per day of surplus raw water, raw meaning untreated water, beyond our anticipated needs of our Norfolk residents and businesses or any of the needs of our wholesale customers, um, which include the Navy, Chesapeake, and the Western Tidewater Water Authority, which is made up of Suffolk and Isla White County. And obviously, an additional water sale would help generate uh, revenue that we could use to um, improve and reinforce the resilience of our top quality water system. Given the water needs of both cities, city staff uh, came up with a recommendation that Norfolk and Virginia Beach simultaneously execute both a water sales agreement and an extension of the water services agreement by which we treat the water with three major uh, terms. The first was that Virginia Beach would pay Norfolk $20 million up front. Uh, second, they would immediately begin buying 10 million gallons per day of our raw water at the same price that we charge our other raw water customers, which are Chesapeake and the Western Tidewater Water Authority. And at the fiscal year 19 water rate, it's $1.31 per 1,000 gallons. And that 
for 10 million gallons per day, that would generate $4.78 million in additional revenue annually. Um, and again, we hope to be able to use that water revenue to improve our water system strength and resilience. Uh, the third component is that the water services agreement would be extended to 2060 and it have an evergreen provision. And that evergreen provision would mean that the contract would automatically renew every year unless one of the parties gave 10 years written notice that they wanted to terminate it. And so given that the first year that either party could terminate the agreement would be in 2050 and they'd have to give the others um, 10 years notice so it would actually terminate in 2060. So because of the benefits to both Norfolk and Virginia Beach, uh, staff recommends that City Council approve the ordinance tonight that would authorize the City Manager to simultaneously extend the existing water services contract and enter into a contract to begin selling Virginia Beach 10 million gallons per day of our raw water under the terms we just talked about. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Good. Doc, you started yes, out with a deficit, and now you have a surplus. <laughs> <laughs> my guess is you've already started spending it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alan? Um, can oh, sorry. One more thing. Yes. I'm sorry. Can I get one more thing? Um, I would like to ask um, the manager and council to consider giving... December 24th as an entire day off. I think we have it as a half a day off, but to me, I don't see the point in having employees out of work on Friday and Saturday come in for half a day when we're probably only gonna have a skeleton crew anyway, and then leave again for Christmas and the 26th. So I think the 24th would be a nice I'm gift. disappointed you guys didn't beat her this year to this. <laughs> I, I, don't you know she annually asks for he this? He doesn't know it's that. She's going to move to August. Yeah. He doesn't know that. Usually I do it in June. They you last year. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, the 24th, that's a full-day holiday. Okay. Alan? I move that the members of the Council of Assembly Reform the closed meeting on October 23rd, 2018 at 6 p.m. The 10th floor conference room of the City Hall building and the City of Dalton for the purposes which are set out in clauses 7, 8, 29, and 3 of subsection A of section 2.2-3711 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended. Seven, consultation with legal counsel for discussion of Norfolk Fort Plain. Eight, discussion of a grant pertaining to HUD issues. 29, discussion of proposed amendment to real estate contract in the Five Points area. And three, discussion of disposition of real estate properties in the downtown area. Mrs. Doyle? Aye. Ms. Gray? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Smigo? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Please refresh your cups and come back so we're working now.